Okay, and uh, hello, and thank you for joining us. So welcome to this presentation, which is part of an ongoing Goose webinar series um, exploring aspects of global sustained ocean observing. I'm Albert Fisher, I'm director of the Goose Program Office, which is headquartered at the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO in Paris. So for the next hour, we'll start with uh, approximately 40 minute set of presentations from Ellen Bellward and Tosta Tanawa. Ellen is head of, uh, head of the unit at the European Union Joint Research Center in Ispra, Italy, and he's the lead author of the 2016 Global Climate Observing System, or GCOS, Implementation Plan, which will be the main subject of the webinar today. Uh, Tosta, who will be joining uh, Alan, is a scientist at Gilmar in Kiel, uh, Germany, and he is also the newly appointed co-chair of the Goose Steering Committee, as well as a co-author on the Ocean Chapter of the GCOS Implementation Plan. So GCOS uh, has the same four sponsors as Goose, that's WMO, uh, the IOC, UN Environment, and the International Council for Science. And its aim is to provide comprehensive information on the total climate system, so that covers the ocean, but also the atmosphere, um, the terrestrial systems, uh, and the cryosphere. After Tosta's and Alan's presentation, we'll conduct a question and answer session by chat, and the chat window is already open. You can see it in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. You can start asking clarifying questions already during the presentation itself. And so um, I should also let you know that the session is being recorded, and a link to the recording will be put on the Goose website, as well as on the Goose uh, YouTube channel, where you can find all of the old web. Thanks, Albert, and hello, everybody. Yeah, it's my pleasure to be the, the coordinator for the writing team, and I'll show you the writing team a little bit later on in the presentation. But uh, the most important thing here is it's the third implementation plan, uh, but it has a slightly different title. It's the Global Observing System for Climate Implementation Needs. Um, I'll come back to that in, in a second or two, but it, it shows a move forward, which has been a constant feature of, of, of this plan, in fact. Um, part of a long heritage, in fact, GCOS, the Global Climate Observing System, has been making a sequence of presentations regularly to the Framework Convention on Climate Change on the, the adequacy of systematic observations for climate. And the latest of those was in 2015, and that was the status of the Global Observing System for Climate. So that, if you like, is a, is a sort of summary of what's going on and what's what's adequate and what isn't. And then that's presented to the to the parties who in each year have come back and said, well okay, well tell us what we need to do to fix the gaps and make it from an inadequate to an adequate system. And we had the first implementation plan back in two thousand and four, then a two thousand and ten update, and then we had the two thousand and sixteen update that was prepared in response to a demand from COP21. So COP21 accepted the status report uh, and came back saying, yes, all right, well, tell us what we need to do to make it better then. So prepare the new implementation plan. So that's what's been prepared. And that was then submitted to COP22 in December um, and was accepted. Uh, that the, the full decision is available on the web, but the sort of key part are uh, that the, the COP uh, welcomes it, notes with appreciation the assessment of the climate-related observations, uh, that there are new variables, that we're moving towards new users or multiple uses, so not just the traditional sort of climate modeling use, but mu much broader. And COP21 itself had also asked us to look at the mitigation an adaptation side of it. So it was a much bigger ask than the previous ones, but COP22 pretty much accepted that we got it right. Um, the people that got it right are, are listed here, and you've got Tosta, who's, who's going to be speaking after me, and, and Carolyn Richter, and, and, and the whole team from the GCOS Secretariat, who were, were brilliant throughout the thing, Steve Briggs, who provided the steer from the, uh, from the, the, the steering committee. And then all the scientists, that sit on the Atmospheric Observation Panel for Climate, the Ocean Observations Panel for Climate, and the Terrestrial Observation Panel for Climate. And we shouldn't forget that we also had something like 2,000 comments from two review cycles. So this is, a, this is not just a, an in-house report. It's, it's, it's very much reviewed, peer-reviewed by, by the community. 
Um, what did you get for all that effort? An executive summary, of course. You got part one, which is meeting the needs, which is, if you like, it's not quite a, a, an executive summary. It's, 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 it's much more in depth than that, but it does set the scene for the broader elements of climate observation, for consistent observations across the Earth system, and for cap capacity development, which again was, again, at COP22, was something that was stressed uh, in the decision. Please make sure that this thing is implemented everywhere. Um, part two of the report is the more classical implementation plan, which goes through domain by domain, atmosphere, oceans, and terrestrial, listing the various essential climate variables and saying who needs to measure what and when and, and how and to, to what level of accuracy. And then there are the annexes, which are actually very important in this report, which is a, an ECV product requirements um, table, which gives very detailed analysis and will help um, observation providers, particularly from the, the satellite community, but also in situ as well. So part one sets the scene, and it points out the fact that, yes, climate change is, is, is of course, a, a massively uh, important factor for all of us, but it, it, it set the scene, in fact it referred to the global risk landscape of 2016 where climate change was for the first time flagged up as the number one risk, but in fact this year's edition again emphasizes that we're on the right track in that all five environment related risks are assessed as being uh, above average in terms of impact and likelihood. That's things like natural disasters, loss of biodiversity, uh, extreme weather events, um, water and, and the like. Um, the Paris Agreement and, and the UNFCC is not the only thing that this, this serves, and we have a sensitivity to the whole Agenda 2013 and the SDGs, and again, this graphic really does, it, it sets the story which the report makes out that time isn't necessarily on our side. Um, my video seems to have gone a bit funny then, but come back. Okay, how did we get there? Well, the implementation steps is, is threefold. First, it's GCOS establishes through its science panels the variables to be monitored. That's critical. The science panels have a long-term role to play in all of this. Secondly, GCOS undertakes regular periodic reviews that monitor how these ECVs are observed in practice, and those are the adequacy reports, and then the response to those is what uh, ensures the continuity. So this implementation has been really set up over the last, uh, well, since the early 90s, uh, and, and it works. So we're not going to change it. What does that process bring us? It ensures that the climate system continues to be monitored. I mean, <laughs> otherwise there wouldn't be an awful lot of point in us doing it. It improves the global, regional, and local long-term climate forecast. Um, and essentially, the, one critical thing on that is filling gaps in the networks. It's refining the essential climate variable requirements. Um, as measurement techniques improve, then the ECVs themselves evolve to some extent. Uh, and it's also looking at how we can use these data across the global cycle. More and more, especially in the light of, of post-Paris, is to support adaptation and mitigation uh, and improve the provision of useful information to users, this notion of climate services. Um, always observing additional parameters, pushing the envelope. Uh, what we can do now is not going to be what's being done in, in 10 years' time and improve the communication on the state of the climate. Keep going, keep improving. Um, I think a common thing throughout the whole of the way GCOS works is, is improving collaboration. Continuity. This list is the essential climate variables that were produced in the status report in 2015. Now, as I said, none of this stands still, and so by the time you get to the implementation plan at the end of 2016, that list has evolved, and it includes ocean surface stress, ocean surface heat flux, marine habitat properties, land surface temperature, lightning, greenhouse gas fluxes. So the implementation itself drives progress, if you like. So this is now the definitive list of essential climate variables, which the COP22 decision acknowledges. It, it specifically cites this table as being the definitive list of ECV. The report, for the first time, also goes into looking at what needs to be done for adaptation. And so there are actions there on things like improving data stewardship, on coordination, 
on long-term research and observations. And again, to some extent, these are reflected in the in the COP decision that uh, that accepted this report. But it's the important thing there is is looking to that new thrust towards adaptation and mitigation. Is this having an impact? Yes, it is. I mean, in Europe, for example, under the mitigation, there's a lot of discussion now under a whole new generation of space um, and in situ and modeling that would help on the CO2 uh, side of things. So we have the whole CO2 process as part of our Copernicus program. So people are taking note of what's said. Observations for adaptation, mitigation, and climate indicators. Indicators there um, from, the, from the oceanographic domain, heating of the ocean from more. I'm on the terrestrial side more. It's on land cover change. It's how can those be used? I'll come back to those in a minute. Um, this report points out that a lot of the variables have multiple uses, not just climate change convention, but also biodiversity, climate, um, combat desertification, and the Sendai framework for, um, for disaster risk reduction, uh, as well as the, the sustainable development goals. We also looked in this report at the way that those observations might cross the three main Earth system cycles, and there's a whole chapter devoted to that in the report. Capacity building is, is very much a part of it, and we're holding regional workshops and activating national coordinators. And again, the COP22 decision reflects that in that it comes back and says this is the way things need to be done using existing um, data and existing initiatives. Part two, 183 pages. I'm not going to go through 183 pages. It goes through it variable by variable and cites the, 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 the current state of, the, uh, of the, the observations, where it needs to be improved, who needs to do it, and who needs to take action. Um, very specific and uh, very detailed. The um, annex is a slight departure, but the, the decision to put in a detailed product requirement is to try and speed up the time lag between the implementation plan and the response from the space agencies. In the past, what's happened is it's gone to COP, COP have come back, and then they've traditionally made a, a decision which has recommended that parties with agencies get those agencies to start addressing the needs of the IP. This time, we've done it more in tandem, so, so things should go somewhat faster. And we've extended that same analysis to all the observations because it's, it's really useful. <laughs> Where are we going with it? The impact that we've got, continuity, evolution, and progress. Uh, addressing information needs for adaptation and mitigation for the first time, uh, transparency framework and other elements of the Paris Agreement. Uh, we're looking at greater efficiency, partly because of serving more than one convention and more than one user. Likewise, with improved capacity building and outreach and information exchange between conventions. Um, that will be aided by having a common set of variables, if you like. That also helps to focus demand on core providers because it's, you know, do it once, serve four or five different user communities. And that's always a, a pretty good thing. And you can also focus particular products on core users. So you can say the variable in this particular form will be useful for climate modeling, and this form will be for sustainable development goal 15 on land degradation, for example. So that's the sort of way that it, it, it works. Um, oops, I seem to have lost this. I'm going wrong here. So that's the last slide for me there. Um, I did have a short example just to give you an idea of how the variables cross. Did you want me to show that? The water one? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm not hearing you, actually. Some reason. Your, your mic seems to be muted, Toste. Well, I, I, okay. I'm not muted now. Do you hear me? So I think you should show this slide. Yeah, you, you want me to show them. Okay. So this is just very quickly to give you a feeling of how these variables, where the, where the, the implementation plan is now looking at cross uh, use. Um, this is just a, a, a whole example of high resolution spatial variables that can be produced by the sort of Landsat class, Sentinel-2 class of, of instruments. 
And if we look at lake area, take that one example, that then comes into um, SDG goal 6, where you're looking at the percentage of change in wetland extent over time. So completely new user community, if you like, but it's going to serve multiple uses. We have a data set now where we have maps like this, which have a 32-year record of water occurrence on the surface, and that's month by month, year by year, over 32 years. This is a river in, in, in India, and basically the white areas have never been water, the blue have always been water, and the sort of purpley colors are where the occurrence has been less frequent over the 32 years. And that's documented in a whole series of maps, which can be used by the climate modelers, but can also be used by the SDG community for looking at change. Um, what we found, and again, even in GCOS terms, if we're looking at the indicators of impact, and we're looking at that land cover change um, back in the, in the early section. Um, oh, it says my sharing capabilities will be removed in five minutes. <laughs> Is that right? No, don't worry about that, Alan. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Well, we've got 90,000 square kilometers of permanent surface water have disappeared over the last 30 odd years. That's, that's a whole lake superior. But 184,000 kilometers of dried land have been submerged by dam building. So we, we think of, of, of what's changing in terms of lakes and things. We've actually made the world twice as wet as it was in terms of lake area, if you like. And we're able to map that. So the loss is the little red area that you can see. Um, which is things like uh, the Aral Sea, uh, the gains are much more difficult to spot because they're everywhere. There's something like 24 countries that have increased by, by more than 1,000 kilometers, but it's all dam building uh, that's gone on, except for the uh, Tibetan Plateau, where we've got something like 8,000 square kilometers of land have gone underwater in 30 years because of increased snow melt and, and, and glacier melt. And this is all documented now. Uh, and it's made available using the sort of GCOS philosophy of full, free, and open data. So this website allows anybody, anywhere, to go in and get those data. And they're being used by climate modeling now to improve the sort of uh, constraints of the models because you get a very accurate picture of where surface water has been invariant over 32 years. But we're also picking up the whole side of things with, um, uh, with the impacts as well. So I think that's one example of where the GCOS implementation plan is, is now beginning to, to go beyond pure climate. And I think that's probably enough scene setting for me, Tosca. So I'm going to stop that now and hand over to you. OK. Thank you very much, Isla. Um, so I'm Tosca Tanner. I'm at Diomar in Keith. I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to particularly look at the or talk about the, the ocean part of the GCOS implementation plan, which I was one of the co-authors to. And I'm going to look at that also in the GOES perspective, um, looking at connection to climate information and services and adaptation, mitigation, and also the sustainable development goals that which um, Alan alluded to. So this is how the, the new implementation plan look like. You've seen it before. I'm going to start with a little bit of motivation on why we are observing climate. And these are now a few slides on plots and figures and facts that are in the IPCC assessment report five. So that is another important part of that as a cycle value chain where the observations lead to data products that leads to um, information product and, and science that goes into assessments. And through these assessments, we can then assess how well we are observing and understanding the system. Um, and it gives you the motivation why we actually are doing this. The left panel here is the average temperature change per decade um, in average of a low up top 700 meters on the top panel, and then you have the average zonal section, and you have a global picture of temperature change average from 1960-1955 to 2010, and you see how it goes from grayish to reddish, getting warmer, 
In the lower panel here, you actually see how the temperature change between surface and 70 meters has increased, in, indicating a change in, in stratification. And on the right hand side, you do see the change in temperature and heat content in the very deep layers below 1,000 meters down to 6,000 meters as it is um, of the ocean. And this is another way of looking at it. It's looking at the heat content. And you can see here on the left panel how the heat content of the ocean is increasing with time um, from a different various method methods to calculate that. You can also see how that heat content is distributed between top ocean and, and very deep ocean. And the right panel really shows where the heat content of the of the climate system is going. And interesting enough, 93% of the heat content or the extra heat content from global warming is actually ending up in the ocean. A little bit more in the top 700 meters in the deep part, but you look at that, the, the pinkish kind of color here, atmosphere, it's a very small component of that whole heat sink. And that is actually what drives the, the, the targets for the uh, COP21. There's also changes in salinity, and the left panel shows you the average salinity of the surface ocean. The lower panel to the left shows you where the changes are. So areas with high salinity in the surface tend to get saltier, and the ones that are less salty tends to be even less salty in, in, in with time. The complicated picture here to the right is uh, for three different oceans, looking at salinity, density, and temperature, and you can see, yes, there is a lot of changes uh, the last 50 years, so these are changes over 50 years. It's getting warmer, the density is increasing somewhere and decreasing somewhere, increasing stratification, and also the salinity distribution is changing. And these are all from observations. To the left here, we see four graphs that are, I think are really interesting uh, in terms of observations, four graphs of sea level change. The top left graph is showing the heat sea level change from the late 19th century up to today um, using tide gauges and a different, few different methods to, to interpret this data, which are more or less consistent. Panel B shows the difference between satellite derived altimeter measurements and the tide gauge, and they are roughly consistent. To the C panel, you actually do uh, the same sea level change here from height gauge is compared to the thermostatic component as measured by the uh, profiling uh, profiles, uh, salinity uh, temperature profiles in the ocean. Um, so you see that some of that is actually because the ocean is warming and uh, gaining volume. And some of the sea level changes uses some other process. And you can see here how the, the, the error bars on the thermostatic component really drastically goes down with time as this algo comes online. So we are improving our capacity to measure interior ocean temperature. The right hand panel shows the difference between uh, the sea level as an altimeter, which is absolute sea level change, versus the combination of the steric from Argo floats, et cetera, and, and the satellites that measure Mars. So we know there is you know mass changes. We're getting more water in the ocean, but the water we have is also getting bigger. So that is at least four different observing systems that by combining them, provides different information. And by the right hand plot, you see the tide gauges of the world are actually shown very different colors, indicating that uh, sea level change is very, very much a regional uh, issue. It's not the same everywhere. The ocean is taking up a large amount of carbon dioxide. So far, about a third of the anthropogenic carbon that's been emitted is stored now in the ocean. And the plot here shows you where that is. Uh, in the top left here is the reddish, it's where there are a lot of anthropogenic carbon stored in the ocean. So that is an important part to keep track of for um, being able to predict atmospheric carbon dioxide, that is greenhouse gas warming potential, but also to assess things like ocean acidification, because carbon dioxide, as you know, uh, in the ocean decreases pH. Now here we see time series from uh, ocean time series. Uh, from Atlantic and the Pacific, how part of the pressure of carbon dioxide goes up. 
how the pH goes down and the carbon di um, carbonate ion concentration reduces with time. These are all observations. They do make sense. Um, we also see pH and changes in, in car carbonate concentration on the right panel. And what's interesting here is that the black solid line and the black dashed line in the lower panel, that is the area when the red line crosses those, then that carbonate the organite or calcite does get undersaturated. And this, this interface where they cross tends to increase or move closer to the surface, making this a less hospital place for a certain calcium carbonate building organism. We have changes in oxygen related to changes in ventilation, but also changes in oxygen heat content. So Goose is looking at observations in the ocean for three different main benefit areas this is the climate, operational, and ocean health. This talk is obviously focused on, on the climate, but as Alan really showed you and told you is that we can observe for one thing and use that for another society the benefit area. So the try here in Google and GCOS is to make sure that the observation we do once are used for many different purposes. And a way to do that is working through a framework of ocean observation where you define your requirements, you have a process where you define uh, the actual observations and you have a data output and, and, and processes. So the framework is something that Goose is worked within and this, this thinking is now adopted or has been adopted for a long time maybe in, in GCOS. Um, yeah, and this is the same kind of picture that how you see that in, in the implementation plan how um, we start from the observing system, we have requirements, adequacy that leads to different observations and products and data that leads to some kind of science and assessment, which gives you information about early warning, risk assessment, climate services and stuff, so on. And then, then we go into, you know, making a better word and the, the cycle kind of keeps going. This is a more kind of complete or complicated way of showing this framework uh, where you see in, in the pink area here how different actually observing systems are contributing to, um, to the, this, this um, cycle of the value cycle of climate observations. So this is again the list of the essential climate variables in the ocean. And for those of you that are familiar with the essential ocean variables, you will see that there are very much overlap. There are a few EUVs that are not ECVs. Um, and there are also, if, if for those of you that are familiar with the essential climate variables from the 2010 implementation plan, you will see there are slightly changes here in that we are not differentiating between surface ocean and interior ocean for, for different reasons. And there are a few new um, ECVs like nitrous oxide and marine habitat properties. Uh, this this GCOS implementation plan is actually including much more on the biology and biochemistry room than the previous did. So that I think is a progress. This is just a table of the central climate variables in the ocean space and different networks versus different networks. And these crosses indicate that that particular network are delivering on that particular ECV, and you can look at that in, in the implementation plan yourself. So the Global Ocean Observing System is organized by user-driven requirements, and now these are some climate-relevant ones, so you know, monitoring climate change, detecting and attributing climate change, and national economic development, and understanding of modeling and prediction systems. To meet the requirements, we need to get organized uh, through global networks that are organized around a particular platform or a observational approach. They hold the different missions and Im implementation targets. The composite observing network is to observe these ECVs on a global scale, but with different temporal and spatial scales, depending on you know feasibility and, and requirements. These ECVs do have that in a little bit different scale and different way. So uh, these things that I show you on the, on the slides now are all um, just copy and paste from the implementation plan itself. 
So you, and these are kind of what I think some of the key uh, statements in there. So we define the requirements for the global observance uh, system. So the, there's a need to expand the monitoring capacities uh, by technology and novel technology, communication and data management infrastructure. So we're looking at the mixture of proven satellite and in situ technologies, which is really important. And I'll show you that in, in the sea level rise example, how they, these are actually being combined. Um, it's also a need to assess existing regional and national plans on, on monitoring on the climate system. And there's also a paragraph here about the importance of working data centers, the data structure, the data are not useful if they are not able, you know, you cannot extract them in a, in, a, in, a, in a good way, in a smart way. And the plan actually talked about global data assembly centers focused around ECVs rather than on platforms. Because if you're interested in temperature and salinity, it doesn't really matter which platform is doing that observation, but you're interested in the product. An issue here is um, getting sustained funding and the plan notes that lots of the observations in the ocean are based on short-term research agency support and not really set up for sustained observing. Um, so these are the federal financial arrangement that we need to improve. Um, satellite observations tend to be better organized than the in situ observations. And on these slides, I'm going to show you some examples of networks that are important for ocean observation. This particular one shows GoShip, that's the repeat hydrography measurements from ship along these lines that you see on the map that are repeated roughly every 10 years. Uh, this is another observing system, Argo, you know, Argo floats. Um, and this particular slide is about improving technologies for new opportunity. And Argo is something that's been coming online the last 20 years and now is our key climate observing, maybe the key or one of the key ones for, for the ocean at least. Um, so we need to work on improving uh, satellite and in situ sensors and platform. We need to get higher resolution in both space and time. And uh, the tendency is actually moving towards more autonomous platforms like such as Argo. And Argo is now, uh, and there are many sensors for biochemistry and biology that now are starting to be deployed on autonomous sensors platforms. This particular slide here is showing this, what's called ocean sites. There are moorings or buoys on, the, on a fixed place in the ocean making measurements with high temporal state resolution but with a spatial resolution. Um, and that kind of requirement is also fulfilled with this uh, combination of different platforms. <clears throat> there are 57 actions for the ocean in the implementation plan. I just showed two examples here, action 01, coordination of enhanced shelf and coastal observations for climate. So it says an action, it describes a benefit, it gives you a time frame, it tells you who's going to do it, it, in, it indicates an indicator, you know, are we doing this, are we improving on the system, we need an indicator, and it gives you an annual very rough approximate cost of what it will, call, what it will cost. And I have a, in all action items, the boxes, all the 57 boxes for the ocean and all the other hundreds plus for the whole implementation plan, are structured in this way. And action three, I thought it was particularly relevant, is the data quality uh, about sustaining and increasing efforts of quality control and reprocessing of current and historical data records. And in my point of view, too little has been invested in that particular part of the climate system, particularly for the ocean. And we need to improve quality and we need to provide uh, quality control and quality improvement procedures um, for that. And it's all listed in the implementation plan. And with that, I thank you for my part, and I think we're open to take question. Thank you very much, uh, Alan and Tasta. And, um, and yes, the, the floor is open for questions, so you can go ahead and type questions in the box, and I'll kick things off with a question of my own. 
Um, first, a, a comment, really. I just wanted to comment on the relationship between uh, Goose and GCOS. So uh, Tasta showed you some things about the framework for ocean observing and the way that Goose uh, works. These are really drawn from the best practices developed in, in GCOS. Uh, we have a joint panel, which is uh, looking after physics and climate for Goose, and is the ocean panel for GCOS, the Ocean Observations Panel for Climate, OOPC. And really, Goose's climate objectives are expressed through GCOS, and GCOS's ocean implementation is managed by Goose and by, by JCOM. Um, so I have first, I have, I have a question for, um, for Alan, actually. Um, you showed, early, in your first talk, you showed the history of all the reports to, uh, from GCOS to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And I know you've been involved with some, quite a few of them going into the past, probably not all the way back to the very beginning. But I want to ask you, how, how have you felt the interaction between uh, the diplomats and the policymakers at the Framework Convention and the scientists in GCOS, which are bringing them scientific information? How have you seen that um, evolve over time? Alan, and I think I've muted you, so let me unmute you. Unmute yourself, unfortunately. Okay, are we working? Yes, we are. Go ahead. Have I unmute? Have I unmuted? Unmuted? We can hear you. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, no, I, that's a good question. Um, I, I, I think that uh, you know the the reaction to the adequacy reports has just got more and more profound um, when. When each adequacy report is presented to the to the COP, it's taken very very seriously, and I think that the the reliance on the quality of the science that's gone into them is just it, well, the quality of the science is just so impressive that the policymakers can't ignore it, and they don't ignore it, and they come back every time and said, "Tell us how to implement this." And then when the implementation plans have been produced, I've seen huge impacts. I mean, in my own world, in in the in the Copernicus world. You have things like we now have a, a, a Copernicus climate change service. That was unthinkable even even 10 years ago. No way. And now it's very much part of it. So, yeah, there's a real response to it all. Here, actually, because it's, it's really this um, GCAS is at the science policy interface when it's talking to the, the framework convention. Um, you mentioned also that the GCAS implementation hmm. plan has uh, looked at uh, other challenges, the links to the sustainable development goals, the Sendai a framework for disaster risk reduction. What do you think are the, so the argument is that uh, climate observations are also useful in other contexts, but are there some changes? What are the biggest changes to the way climate observations need to be taken to respond to some of these other user needs? It's sometimes scale. Uh, a lot of the user needs, like the the SDGs, require a very very fine spatial resolution. Um, if you're thinking more in the in the in the goose area, I think that you'll find that that impact comes when you start moving into the coastal margins. Uh, and if you start moving into that domain, then you know the spatial dimension starts to go up. So I think that's that's probably the biggest is the demand on the space. Uh, timeliness timeliness is less an issue because both communities need need very fine temporal resolution and I would say in terms of accuracy it's the other way around the climate uh, the demands from the climate community are so strict that the quality of the measurements that we make for that will pretty much de facto meet the user requirements from the other communities so the only way the only real change is on spatial and from this is my personal view is that you know, for the accuracy levels, the, the climate community already specifies things so so tightly that um, it's going to be more on the on the spatial side of things. Do you want to answer that question as well? About so. yeah, sure, I I, I agree. Uh, the um, requirements and accuracy is, is very high for climate. Um, but maybe the, the timeliness and other requirements in the, in the coastal zone um, is probably for for other services than climate. The, the requirement for accuracy is probably less, but maybe 
the requirement for a timely and a high temporal resolution and timely access to the data is, is higher when you're talking about ocean health and operational services. Whereas for climate, you find with having a little bit of delayed data stream, where for the other you know, health and, and operation service, you obviously need you know, near real-time data submission. And that can come at the cost of accuracy and precision, but you, with, um, with post-processing of your data, can actually respond to for climate services. Okay, thanks. So we have a, we have a shy audience. We don't have any questions yet, so please do ask your questions in the, uh, in the chat box, and I'll push out forward with my questions. Um, the GCAS implementation plan is organized uh, by chapters, by domains, um, so focusing on the atmosphere, the ocean, the terrestrial domain. But you have, in this uh, latest edition, um, looked at the interfaces between domains or looked at things from the point of view of uh, different climate cycles you mentioned briefly, Ellen. Um, so what are some of the challenges of looking at those interfaces, looking across the different domains that scientists tend to work in and to look at the whole climate system? Uh, one of the biggest is that we tend to be sort of inward looking in each of our own communities. I mean, that's why it's, it's, it's really a delight to, you know, to have worked with Toste and the, and the oceanographers and the atmospheric uh, scientists on the implementation plan itself. That's one forum where we actually get together and we kick around some of this stuff. And we always find exciting uh, synergies when we're doing that. And then we go back to our own communities again. So somehow... <laughs> finding a way to, to foster those groups is going to, or fostering those links is going to be one of the biggest challenges, I think. GCOS itself is really pretty good at it. You know, the, the steering committee brings the three chairs together once a year at least, and the, you know, the implementation plan and the, and the, and the, the status report involve multiple cross, uh, cross panel meetings. But the broader communities, we, we do tend to work in boxes a little bit. So that, that's one challenge, is working outside the box. I do agree on that, and it's really great to work together in, in a, writing a document like that. But in addition to that, I would say that fluxes. When we talk about cycles, we need to worry about fluxes, and that is maybe something that is new in this report. So looking at mm, carbon yeah. flux, you know, carbon in different domains, the fluxes become important, and there are some ways you can measure that directly or infer them, but fluxes is part of that. So that is something. So there are, I mean, speaking from the ocean point of view, when you're talking yeah. about fluxes, there are some interfaces mm -hmm. that are quite important uh, at the coast between the terrestrial domain and the, and the ocean domain, and of course, between the atmosphere and, and the ocean in terms of the surface fluxes at the, at the ocean. Is, are there, there are strong communities actually around that. Have there been any attempts to, to pull them in a little more strongly into the work of GCAS? Costa, maybe I can ask you from an ocean centric point of view to answer that question. Yeah. I think we're working hard in Goose in generally to, to get the coast, the very coastal community involved more in Goose. And I think that the same is true for GCOS. And I think this implementation plan really provides the, the meat or the background or the mandate to engage this community when you actually are talking about fluxes uh, between different domains and, and the earth cycles. Um, I think we are, that is an area we can improve on, and I hope we can improve on it, and we should improve on it. And I think that Looking at cycles really provides the, a baseline. We have a question from uh, Estella, uh, which is focused really on the use of uh, climate mm -hmm. information. So the, the information on climate change available and the quality you describe in our days is immense. How can we improve the communication of that data for others, if it's possible, to use at the national and regional scale, including private and public authorities? And how would, would doing that for that communication, how can we contribute to, to more and better fighting of climate change negative impacts? Maybe uh, Alan and then Tosta? Yeah, uh, I'm going to bung up that last slide again. Uh, if you see these slides, um, if I go to the last one, the, the thing that GCOS has done, I think, 
to really uh, push stuff, that one there, is, is making data sets full, free and open. And uh, th this Global Surface Water one, for example, I mean, okay, full disclosure, it's mine. So, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm publicizing my own stuff, which isn't, isn't so good. But it's one example, and it wouldn't have happened without that philosophy, you know, that philosophy of full, free and open. So I think, I think that, you know, we're increasingly maybe in the political world, people are saying, well, we've got to put prices on things and get return for our investments in space and stuff. And yes, you do. But the, the benefits of, of putting this stuff out there is enormous. And, and, and just... You know, having something like that, which is available to private and public authorities, and they can do what they like with it. That's that's the point. It's not just putting it out there and saying, "Oh, it's free, but not for commercial use or whatever." It's I don't mind if somebody makes commercial use of it. Um, it's full, free, and open. Um, but it's a very important question from Estella. Is We've got lots of thinkers I, I and, completely and, agree, and, and, and not so many communicators. <laughs> oh, sorry. Jiko's philosophy, which is similar to Goose's philosophy, is open and, and free access so that, to data. Is that sufficient to mm -hmm. actually make use of Here. the data at a local level, the free and open? I know it's a, it's a very important first step that the data is available, but how do we promote actually the use of, of that data mm -hmm. in, 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 no. in decision-making processes? Well, I think that's a very good question, Albert. No, it's it's not the full answer, is it? It it's it's part of the answer, but it's not the full answer. Um, education's definitely an important part of that. Um, having things like the climate services that that go beyond data sets like that surface water one, which don't really answer the final questions that that, that policymakers might have, is important. Um, making sure that the modeling communities are using the best available observations is important. Tasta, you described um, in your talk the, the sort of value chain that is part of the, um, the, the really the, the, the global climate mitigation problem, going from observations, uh, in your case, ocean observations, but all climate observations, to research, to the assessment by the IPCC, and that very strong link from the IPCC to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change process. So that describes basically, I think, which has also been a big part of the success of GCOS, is the, the ability to focus on a user community and uh, a policy link that is global in scale that really is uh, a common challenge that we all have in terms of climate mitigation. Um, Alan, you talked a little bit about expanding towards um, the challenges of uh, climate adaptation uh, and mitigating the impacts of climate change at a, at a more local level. So the challenge is different from global monitoring and forecasting, which you described as the main points of the implementation plan. We have a user community, it goes back to the last question from Estella, we have a user community that's much more diverse. Do you think you can def still define common requirements at a global level? I think some of them are. I mean, the report um, in that table I showed, I'd have to go back to the slide to make sure I didn't make mistakes, but the, 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 the report um, pulls out some fairly high level um, actions which are applicable pretty much universally. But you, you're right again that when you come down to mitigation and adaptation, you go much more locally. So um, there is an element of that that we would need to be careful on. Um, is someone putting the slide up? Yeah. It, uh, but it, it, it's... Um, I, I think if we... If, if, this this implementation plan took the first steps and it started to look at what would be the sort of consistent cross-cutting issues for adaptation and mitigation. And I think within that framework, you could then go to more detailed specifics by continent, by region. So it's a good start. So ideally, would Let you, me say that. do you think you'd have to have at, at a regional and even a national level a whole series of GCOSs that are focused on 
the adequacy and the implementation uh, focused on regional requirements? And, and do you think that there could be some similarities across the different regions? I'm not sure I would go that far. I think you... I'm not sure I would go so far as for regional GCOSs. I think the whole point about GCOS is the global in it, in its title. It provides that global consistency. You might go to regional specificity, like indeed GCOS does in its in its regional workshops and its and its um, the the way for capacity building. You recognise that some areas the the networks need to be reinforced at a more fundamental, at a more basic level than than in other regions. So. There's, there's regional variability within the global framework, but I would think I think for GCOS it's very important to maintain that that global um, that global level of, of 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 commonality, if you like. So I put up this slide of of the sea level change here because I think it really well illustrates that global versus regional. Mm. You can clearly see how the global sea level range is, is increasing, but when you look at the map here, you see all kind of colors between blue and, and purple, indicating that it's really a regional problem. And it ties back to the previous question that having the data available is, is, is not enough. We need to turn that in, in, into information that is useful for policymakers and stakeholders. Mm. And that information most often has to be very regional tailored. A region, you know, if you're, if I'm a special planner in Kiel, I want to know what the sea level is going to be in Kiel. I don't care about the sea level in in Bali, <laughs> mm. right? So, so it has. It, I think it goes together. Mm. Um, so, so I think providing the data and then making sure that we have a process in place where you can turn that into information on a regional scale. That is the challenge, and I think we have to work very hard together with with WCRP. That drives the science and, and can provide a little bit of that interface towards products, information products. And I think making data available, there's a certainly a, a great potential to commerce, commercialize Justin, many of these products. Of the regional I agree, Justin. Go ahead, Alan. No, 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 you carry on. I was just going to say that I, I think that map's a very good illustration because it's 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 regionally detailed enough to be regionally relevant if you like it you know it's not a it's not a very coarse scale global product We're, and and that trend is happening in more and more of our our variables they're going to finer and final spe, finer and finer spatial resolution which is why this implementation plan starts to pick up on the usefulness of those products for other user communities as well because we're starting to hit that 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 gap where where you, you cross, uh, you know, you're at a relevant scale. So let me let me go a little further into this into this regional uh, scale and sort of tailoring climate information for particular users. Again, uh, in, in the way GCOS has been working with a kind of global scientific community in order to define the adequacy and the requirements, uh, there is uh, a kind of well-defined user community because the user community often is the one uh, implementing observations very closely to using the observations, the scientists using the observations and producing science and producing climate projections and forecasts that are then assessed by the, by the IPCC. And you've talked about uh, the need to reach a, a larger user community. Uh, the private sector will be part of that, transforming information into, into useful products. How do you think GCOS will have to adapt how it defines adequacy and how it defines implementation requirements. How can it include that larger community in the discussion in the future? Wow, <laughs> that's a tough one. Um... Are there? I mean, are there? For, for example, yeah. I think it's 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 continuing. Yeah, please. Uh -huh. on. Sorry about the time delay. I think it it's, makes the conversation harder. Go ahead, Alan. Oh no. <laughs> uh, no, I I was thinking that um, I mean one thing that that uh, GCOS has always 
pushed is that it's 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 consistency and evolution and improvement and if you continue down that, that line consistency because you need to have a consistent measurement record for anything in the in the climate domain but those measurements are continually evolving we're adding more variables we're adding greater precision and accuracy to the variables we're measuring we're getting finer time resolutions to the very time steps to the variables that we're measuring so that the whole process is consistency and, and evolution and improvement and as improvement comes then then the reliability of the thing will improve and then the relevance of it to the commercial sector that you were you were pointing out starts to grow i think so it's going to but it is a challenge copernicus wow. climate yeah. service in europe that, that europe has developed are there particular um, mechanisms or interfaces to work with the users of that climate service and, and does that information feed back then to the observations Uh, well, I'm not responsible for the management of it. it. It's it's dealt with by the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecasting. They're the they're the main uh, that they run that service. But I think they've got a very good feedback between their users and the way the service is evolving. Yes, I mean I think they meet their users regularly. They have a strong feedback from them. So the services there will definitely evolve in line with user demand. I'm sure of that. Also, do you want to say something? Maybe we want to comment to Marco Stocker that, that no, typed a little bit of, of um, so Marcus Stocker has very thoughtful comment here on with the terms data and information. Uh, in his understanding, when we speak of data, we generally imply observational data or the observations themselves, and those are turned into information, whatever that means exactly. Uh, but information can also be stored as data in, uh, in a data system. Um, so he also wants to argue that uh, an observation can be understood as an information object, the one that integrates the observation value, the results, as well as contextual data, the sensor, the property, the feature, some people call that metadata. And Tostica, why don't you go ahead and respond to that? Mm -hmm. I, I think it's important to make a, a differentiation there. Um, you know, I can go out and, and make Two million observations of partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the surface ocean, and uh, that's a lot of data. And it's it's not easy to derive the useful product from that. It takes a lot of uh, a few assumptions, a few calculations using some empirical relations. It requires some clever interpolation, extrapolation tools to come up with the information product that we really want from from that particular observing system. That is to calculate the annual flux of carbon dioxide between the ocean and the atmosphere. Um, so I think having all these this, this, this steps towards that end result, the information, and I'm talking about information that you can easily convey to a more general audience and to stakeholders, and you can trace back transparently to the observational data. And then I can say, uh, you know, last year the, the ocean took up 2.5 petagrams of carbon. That will be the information. And there's a lot of steps between there, and there's millions of observations and so on. And, and I think the information is actually a bit boiled down to that. And that is, you know, also even if you write 10 scientific papers about the process and the different aspects of all this, in the end, the stakeholders, the, the decision makers will need that particular very short piece of information. It was 2.5 kilograms last year and the year before that was only 1.5. Something happened was at the linear, you know. I, I, these numbers are just Tasta fake. and Alan, maybe, maybe last question. That would be an example. You mentioned the fragility mm. of some of the funding for ocean observations and their sustainability, but how have you seen, uh, you both Tasta and Alan, have you seen the sustainability of observations helped by the GCAS implementation plan or by the designation of essential climate variables? Um, well, from my side, um, I I think it's um, I think it has really had a positive impact. I mean, not not just this 
implementation plan, but the series of them. I think it's recognized as a statement of international scientific community um, recommendations which can be responded to. So things like Copernicus are responding to it. And I think the fact that we have a climate service now and that from all I know, the, 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 the funding for that, at least in this multi-annual financial framework, which is internal speak for funding until 2020, is, is, is sure. And all the right noises are being made for the future. It's, I think people stand up and they take notice of it, definitely. It's a power for good. Awesome. Well, I do agree on that. Uh, I've, in the ocean domain, I think we have a long way to go, but there's certainly a push towards more sustainability in the observations. And I think the GCOS and, and other processes that we have in, within Goose and other projects are helping shaping up and defining the needs. You know, what do we need to, 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 to sustain and, and what are the requirements and which platform do we have? So I agree with Anna, this is a very powerful tool to, to increase sustainability. All right. Well, thank I you. Think Alan, time. Thank you, Tom, very much we want for, to for your time and for your presentation and for uh, answering my questions. Thanks to Marcus also who started a, a good discussion amongst the uh, audience members here about the use of the words data and information, uh, data products, um, and uh, and let's um, yeah, I'm quite hopeful about the future of uh, of climate observations. So thank you very much. Uh, our next uh, webinar series will not be until September. So for those of you in the Northern Hemisphere, enjoy your summers. Those of you in the Southern Hemisphere, we'll see you early in your spring. Thanks to everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for organizing it. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.